share the screen here. Yes. In fact, what I'm going to do. Nope, oh, I had to get started. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the ALG Featured Speaker Series. Today, uh, we have a group from Savannah State University who are going to be talking about some really cool work in British literature, um, particularly pre-industrial revolution British literature, and uh, opening this up, making it more inclusive using OBR. Uh, so I would like to turn this over to Jonathan Elmore and Jenny Halpin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, can everyone see the, the presentation screen here? Yeah, we can. All right, great. Uh, Jenny, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, I'm Jenny Halton. I've been teaching British literature and pretty much whatever else they need me to here at Savannah State for a little over a decade now. Uh, and yeah, that's me. My introduction is very similar. I'm, I'm John Elmore and I've been teaching uh, British Lit and, and a variety of other things, but we're a small department uh, for about seven years now. So uh, we thought we'd start off this project, or this particular presentation with a little bit of, of context and background about uh, why we did this at all and what, what sort of came to the, uh, brought us to the need for it. So as many of you are likely aware, Savannah State University is the oldest public HBCU in Georgia and one of the oldest public HBCUs in, in the country actually the first land grant HBCU in the country too, which we're very proud of. Uh, and, and we're still overwhelmingly uh, an African-American and African diaspora student body. It's between 86 and 90% of our student body in any given year. Uh, within the context of that university, the English department is actually quite small. Uh, there's, I, I, think, I think we're down to nine tenure track faculty this one, might be 10, you know, it's quite small. And one of the effects of this is that Jenny and I are, are the Brit lit faculty, um, and which means that all of the British lit courses end up getting taught by one of the two of us. And for the purposes here, that's meant that, that both halves of the survey, the, the first half of the Brit lit survey, which is, is really British literature from, from its very origins all the way up to about the Industrial Revolution. And then the second half of the survey, which picks up at about the Industrial Revolution and, and goes on to the present, is always taught by one of us. Uh, We've been doing this together for years, and, and a problem that we keep coming up against is that all of the major anthologies, and particularly the, the OERs, which, which we're pretty sensitive to trying to make uh, learning materials very affordable for our students, uh, have a real problem with, with the early part of British literature because they basically, without exception, present the presence of Africans and, and uh, their descendants, the African diaspora as a product of the slave trade in Britain. So they present the appearance of, of Africans and their ascendant and descendants as, as they introduce the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, and this is deeply problematic for a number of reasons. I mean, one, it's just wildly historically inaccurate. That's not true on any level whatsoever. Uh, and, and two, and this is actually, the I, to me at least, and I, I think Jenny would agree with me, the more disturbing part about this, which is that of course, by presenting an entire continent's worth of people and their descendants as, as slaves, first and foremost, presents all sort of really disturbing identification problems, all sorts of really disturbing social justice problems. Uh, and it's really upsetting. And of course, this is particularly acute at, at an HBCU. And so Jenny and I have been aware of this for years. And as one of us gets this section or the other one has it, we tried different things and we found materials. And some of them were OK and even better than OK, but they're all very piecemeal. Uh, and so we finally decided to stop complaining about this problem and do something about it. And, and so, of course, the, the OER opportunities here in the Affordable Learning Georgia seemed like the ideal venue for finally addressing this. The other thing that really helped about this is uh, we ended up being really good friends and, and close colleagues. And, and so, you know, it was really very comfortable to just slip into a kind of project where rather than piecemeal this together and trade materials back and forth, we were going to go ahead and and formalize this into a supplemental textbook. What else you want to say about that, Jenny? You know, I, I think just to underscore that we are an HBCU and not only is it just a problem to treat all of Africa as a source for enslaved people, but 
that treatment is so bad for our students. Um, and it, it works against getting students to engage in something that already feels alien to them, uh, just in terms of they are not 10th century Britons, they're 21st century Americans. Uh, and so to have that extra layer of alienation and objectification really uh, is part of the problem that we were trying to solve here with this textbook. Uh, and, and we wrote it not to replace the existing anthologies, but to be used alongside one or more of them. And so um, we were trying to create a resource that would not only meet our needs and respond pretty directly to the things that John and I were talking to each other about as lacks and as problems that we were encountering in teaching this course, but also as something that would be a resource for faculty at other institutions to be able to slide into what, because it's not in the anthologies, is an understudied aspect in the training side of our careers. And so we had had to do some training of ourselves to get here. Um, and part of what the book is then uh, is an introduction and then four chapters that we wrote to provide that background and information uh, and context targeted towards students in an undergraduate survey, but with the understanding that these are things that faculty might also need a little bit broadening on. Um, and these chapters focus on helping students understand what this problem that our text addresses is, um, how there is this naturalization of treating Africans and Afro-diasporic peoples as enslaved peoples. Uh, another chapter that's framing the ways in which Britons of the period imagined Africa uh, and, and really had strange bases for their imaginings of Africa at the time. Another chapter on the framing of race and religion uh, from the curse of Cain and all of its problems to the Crusades and its uh, related but different set of problems. Um, and then going into some detail on the difference between anti-Black racism in the US and the UK, uh, because that does manifest differently and it does have different histories, even though they are related and have similarities. John, did you wanna jump in there? Yeah, well, just to, just to underscore what you're talking about, Jenny's, of course, right that neither of us had a full background and had to do a lot of research. That was actually one of the really fun parts of this project to learn about this. One, one thing we did know is that there at least was some scholarly material written for other scholars uh, about this problem. This is not a problem that Jenny and I discovered, of course. But the other thing that was kind of interesting that, that neither of us, I think, were fully aware of is how much the historians are head of head, head of literary studies in this particular regard. I mean, and there are literary scholars that work on this stuff that are aware of this, but they're, again, they're only writing to other scholars and the material is not at all accessible to undergrads. And then the other sort of issue is that the, with, with the historians who do a scholarship, I mean, it's in the humanities, but it's a different kind of scholarship than literary studies. It's about also crosswalking that into the field of literary studies and then also making it accessible for students that was uh, some of the significant challenges, but also I think some of the more rewarding parts of, of this project. On that note, we uh, interviewed a number of scholars in the field, both literary scholars and, uh, and historians. And in fact, the historians are kind of our headliners. We, we got really lucky and got some, some rock stars uh, involved in the project with that. And when we decided to make this a really big part of, of the OEG itself, so we, we asked a pretty significant set of questions and we ended up doing this asynchronously. So we sent our, our various interviewees these questions ahead of time. They responded in writing, although we had uh, sort of informal conversations with them as well, just framing this and talking about what we're trying to get in the project. And then they really knocked it out of the park. And so we have the kinds of questions here on the board that we asked them. And what we ended up doing is we asked uh, all of them the same initial questions. And I'm not going to read them all here, but you know, why should we pay attention to what Black people have historically done in Britain? I mean, some of these were very broad kinds of things that were meant to get them to elicit the kinds of general responses that would be most useful to students who, as Jenny said, in most cases have very little, if any, familiarity with this period and with this continent and with this material. I mean, in fact, the most you can hope for in these Britlet surveys from our undergraduate 
population is a familiarity with maybe a Shakespeare play or two, and they really don't know anything about this. And then we asked them some more, you know, involved questions uh, as well. And then we also asked each of our scholars a couple of questions that was focused at their own individual research and at the kinds of publications they've already done, the kind of work they've already done, that it gave them the chance to kind of bring out their own identity some and bring out their own work some. And also to make each interviewee's section of the textbook unique in, in its own way. Jenny. Yeah, and, and I think that one of the things I want to draw out is that you and I, John, put a lot of effort into not just thinking up what the questions were, but thinking about how we could present these questions to our experts in a way that was going to elicit from them student-centered answers. Uh, and so we start with this very basic question, uh, but I think you and I must have spent half an hour or more just on the question of now that we have these questions in what order shall we present them to yeah, I remember that. yeah. Uh, and 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 I really think that that care that we took is important to thinking about how the contributions of others will suit themselves to the work because we didn't really have to do much work at all to make their responses accessible to our students, which ought to be really surprising given that most of these are scholars whose experience and research is far, far away from where our students are. Yeah, yeah, well, and, and I mean, just credit to them too for their ability yeah. to realize who the audience was and, and, and really did a good job. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I thought we'd actually uh, show you a little bit about these folks. Yeah, so two of the people that we uh, reached out to were Dr. Josie Gill and Angela Jacobs, who is a PhD candidate at Old Dominion University that John met at a conference and heard speaking on the subject and was really excited to reach out to her. Um, she's from California and is teaching freshman composition and researching rhetoric and writing and Black British literature, history, feminist rhetorics. Uh, she's published a play as well as uh, working consistently in literary scholarship and just has some really smart thoughts about race and literature and history. Um, Josie Gill is someone that I've known from my research contexts and is currently a senior lecturer in Black British writing at the University of Bristol. Um, she's also working at the Center for Black Humanities there uh, and wrote a book called Biofictions, Race, Genetics, and the Contemporary Novel, uh, which won a pretty impressive prize a couple years ago now. She's a principal investigator of the Black Health and the Humanities Project and has been working recently on questions of decolonization uh, and is really an enthusiastic spokesperson for thinking about the ways in which we think about people affect the ways in which people are able to live their lives. Um, and and she was a little hesitant at first to be brought into this project because her primary research focus is the contemporary, uh, but uh, I was able to convince her that it was worth her time and uh, effort to be thinking about the ways in which the earlier periods really do feed into the context out of which her work emerges. Well, one thing that's funny about her hesitancy uh... She, her response ended up just being the first one we got back and she just knocked it out of the park and I remember personally like that's when I got even more excited about this product when I read Josie's response where you're like this is going to be these interviews and this was actually kind of a, a later thought we had well we should interview these scholars who've been reading about it and, and get this in there and then when her response came back and we realized really how enriching these were going to be uh, it just turned off the project uh we also wanted to be careful though to to honor and, and include the historians on this. So so both both Josie and uh both Josie and Angela are are literary scholars. And we, we mentioned already that the historians are, are head of literary studies in this way. And so it, it takes about five minutes of research in this to run into both of these two figures, Dr. Kaufman and, and Dr. Nubia. And they're both historians and they are the big names right now in this particular question about reframing and rediscovering and repositioning the correct place of Africans and their descendants in, in British history. 
Uh, so the first of these is, is Dr. Kaufman, who is uh, uh, the Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of the Commonwealth Studies. Uh, she's the author of Black Tudors, The Untold Story, and this book has won a number of awards, including the Wolfson History Prize and the Nathan Rodland, Rodland Prize. She studied history at Christ Church in Oxford, and she's now an honorary fellow at the University of Liverpool. Uh, and she's actually currently working on uh, her second book in the project, although if, if you go to her webpage, she, she's basically on the lecture circuit for this right now. She has dozens of invited talks and other sorts of publications. And one thing that's exciting about her, too, she, uh, while she's a, a working historian and does classic history and, and the work of historians, she also is, is very much a public intellectual, and a lot of her stuff is published in in media and in newspapers, and she does interviews and stuff that are meant for the public. And so one of the real strengths of her work is not only is she able to write very, very dense and rich history, she really thinks it's important and is able to do that crosswalk where she makes that very accessible to the public, which of course is perfect for what we're trying to do with this with this project. And then the other story in Dr. Newby, and I actually got to spend about two hours on Zoom with this individual uh, who's just a funny, amazing man. Uh, and he's also on the cutting edge of this. He's a pioneer and internationally recognized academic who's reinventing our perceptions of methodology and pedagogy in regards to diversity and global histories. Uh, he's the writer of Black Amours, Africans in Tudor England, and England's Other Countrymen. Uh, and he's also been a keynote speaker at, at a whole list of things that I'm not going to going to go through here. And he too, a, a little bit less than Miranda, but he too is very much invested in not only does this need to be scholars talking to scholars, but this needs to be a, a public intellectual project that actually reframes the perceptions that cause, well, really smart things like the Broadview Anthology and the Norton Anthology to still make these kinds of mistakes. And he's, he's working really hard to, to correct that. Jenny, do you want to say anything else about our historians? I, I want you to go to the next slide because I want to say something about Miranda that, that connects to it, uh, which is sure. that her uh, her book, Black Tudors, is organized as a, a series of biographies of Black tutors. And, and that was part of the inspiration for what's the final section of our book, which is a miniature encyclopedia, where uh, we were getting exposed to not many narratives of, uh, I think she had about eight different uh, tutors, uh, tutor era Black people in England. Um, and so we started thinking about how can we introduce our students to the people that they would need to know about if they want to be able to think about Africans and Afro-diasporic peoples in Britain before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and one of the people that Miranda talks about is Jacques Francis, who worked as a diver. And you can see here on the slide our um, our little biography of him that's, of course, very much based on what she has published. And we put together quite a number of brief, here's a person that you might encounter, uh, a few ideas along the way. But for the most part, we're giving an encyclopedia of people. Uh, along with that, we found a few images that were um, relevant to illustrating the history of Africans, Afro-diasporic peoples, uh, and just interest in Africa in Britain that goes back quite a way. And so we have a old oil jar uh, with African faces as the illustration uh, that comes from the British Museum's collection. They really helpfully, right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, were launching a digital access to a whole slew of images of items in their collection. And we were able to, from there and other resources, collect a few things to give some visual interest to this book of ours. Well, one thing that was really interesting working through the encyclopedia is just the range of, of entries that, that we ended up coming across and, and creating, uh, all the way back from, from the, the, the so-called Cheddar Man, um, which is really a, a great interest anthropologist. I mean, this is one of the earliest uh, well, fossils actually found that that you know clearly has African ancestry, and this goes back to you know Roman periods here, and, and it really changed the kind of narrative of 
of how folks had been moving around, you know, during the Roman period and earlier than that, up from Africa and into what we now understand to be Great Britain. Uh, and, and the other thing that's just with this encyclopedia is, you know, it's it was so challenging and rewarding because on the one hand, just records weren't terribly well kept throughout the medieval and, and late medieval and early modern period, especially for sort of common folks. And then, of course, there's all of the work that came after that period about erasing the presence of, of Africans and their descendants. And so it's both trying to get through just the historical problem of unearthing stuff that's really old and trying to get through the institutional and otherwise racist problem of, of erasure. And it just ends up being a very kind of piecemeal process that presents this this rich but, but incomplete picture of an entire peoples. And, and this is one thing that I think the encyclopedia really offers students where you, you you see from the beginning the kind of opportunities here where there's so much work left to be done in this work of recovery and, and rediscovery of, of these peoples and their histories. And, you know, we're hoping to use this part of the book to really, you know, talk about research projects for classes and get students excited about possibilities. When I mean, you know, you can go and do some of this work yourself and, and, and work on these things. And students, students get excited about that. Uh, we, we thought we'd close here by talking about uh, more like how the project that we've just described kind of came about and, and how the, the OER process and the Affordable Learning Georgia opportunity uh, kind of manifested with with the two of us. We have the, the printed timeline here. Uh, and of course, as part of the application process, uh, um, a projected timeline is, is asked for. And this is pretty close to what we promised we would do. And there, there was some flexibility here. But in May 2020, we were actually awarded the grant. Uh, and then that's when we began to, to solicit these historians. And we've gotten sort of excited about this project even before we actually had heard we got the grant, which we were very excited about. We were going to do it anyway. And we really sort of begun the pre-planning, the brainstorming, and the work about it uh, in, in the couple of months ahead of this. Uh, the, the kickoff meeting, which was very useful there in June, and a lot of really important information and anyone who's working on one of these grants, that meeting is really valuable. Like you, it's done really well and they, they let you know what's expected just bureaucratically, but also some really good tips and, and uh, advice from people who have gone before and, and how to how to be successful with this and how to how to work on it. Uh, Jenny, you want to finish the timeline? I don't, I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I do want to jump in and say that was June of 2020 and just Oh yeah. Props to Jeff and everybody for how quickly that kickoff meeting became something that was productive over the internet. Uh, we we had some some technical difficulties that were like show stoppingly bad because the universe of technology is bad, not because anybody working on the meeting was bad, and the show did not stop. Um, we, we got everything working and moving, uh, and it was just a gift to be able to receive that remotely. Um, after that, uh, John and I were well and truly kicked off into work, and uh, our workflow really focused on the realities of our teaching schedules uh, and needing to foreground some of our uh, labor into the summer when we do much less teaching. Uh, so during June and July of that first year, we put together those interview questions uh, and started outlining the project in, in some real detail. Throughout fall, we kept working. <laughs> uh, in spring, uh, we did a lot of editing of the interviews for clarity, uh, just your basic copy editing stuff in many instances. And, and planned some reorganization of the final project. This is where we moved that mini encyclopedia to the back of the book um, so that the interviews could be promoted up a little bit more before it. Uh, and then in the summer, we, we did all of the detail work to finish everything up and submitted our report. Uh, and in the fall, I was able to uh, use the book. Uh, and John, if you could pop over to the next slide. Uh, before I do that, let me just say yeah. about this process. Um, 
one thing that humanities in general, and there's actually a lot of work on this, does really, really badly, is that we're, we're way too invested in the kind of individualist scholar model. And the humanities doesn't collaborate nearly as well as, as the hard sciences do. And it, it, it's interesting, but, and Jimmy and I have collaborated on some stuff in the past, and both of us have collaborated with other people. And it, it's fascinating to sort of work on a project like this asynchronously, especially during yeah. the pandemic, you know, with somebody else that you know really well and that you trust really well, because what ends up happening is it does kind of get written in these little short bursts and, you know, massive work will kind of happen where there'll be a text message or a phone call or standing in somebody's doorway or hallway thing. And it's like, oh, I, I touched this this morning. You should take a look at it. And like, I'm thinking I'm going to start this other section tomorrow. And OK, well, I'll jump to the next one. And just these really kind of informal brief talks uh, made it feel very easy. But then it also just, it was amazing what happened after several months of this. And we realized, well, oh, Jenny and I have sent a dozen text messages and probably talked for three or four hours. And yet suddenly there's, you know, 20,000 words sitting in front of us of, of a pretty impressive project. And there were a couple of section, sessions uh, at Jenny's dining room table where we did sit down collaboratively and, and put a couple of, of you know, synchronous hours together and all, but there really wasn't very much of that at all. And I think some of that had to do with the fact of that COVID-19 made us scared to be around other people. And some of it just had to do with the fact that that's actually a very efficient way to work on things. But yeah, let's talk about uh, teaching here. Yeah, um, I, I think we did a lot of intense work in those brief conversations uh, that then was executed on our own, uh, which was the time, but the labor was bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, but this last fall, I taught the uh, survey that we built this book for uh, and was able to use various parts of it. And the students uh, responded with a little bit of confusion. What, what, what is this? Why is your name on it kind of stuff, uh, which I find endlessly amusing. And you get that student response to the text of they say, and they say, hey kiddo, I wrote that sentence. But they responded pretty well to the contextual and background information that I assigned them to read from the beginning part of the book. They, um, we were able to talk about culture as something that is world traveled and not just in a traffic in human beings. Um, and they also responded very well to the interviews that I assigned as a separate set of readings and started thinking about, well, why should we care about Black people's histories in British literature? And why is British literature something that is more than just those dead white people? A few semesters previously, I had assigned students to listen to one of Patrick Stewart's uh, readings of sonnets that he had done through the early part of the pandemic, where he would just tweet out him a video reading a sonnet from Shakespeare every day. And one of my students said to me, why am I listening to this old white man? And well, it's Shakespeare, who's a dead white man, but even so, it's an entirely viable question. And instead of being asked, why am I listening to this old white man, I got students who were interested in, look at these scholars who are talking about the history of Africans and their descendants in Britain, which was really enlivening and just shifted the whole tenor of the course. Yeah, and of course, Jenny and I talked about her experience teaching it while she was doing it. Uh, but but yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to getting the opportunity to do it in the fall. We, we tend to run BritLit 1 uh, in the fall semesters. And, and so we're we're making sure to trade it off. We don't we don't trade it off every fall, but we are definitely this time. And it's because of this book, because I, I want a chance to to use it myself in my own in my own classroom. And so looking forward to that. Yeah. And so I think the time has come to ask whether y'all have any questions. So I'll jump in. Hi, I'm I'm Lucy Harrison, Executive Director of Galileo. Um, what was did you what sort of changes in the way your students are discussing these topics did you see as a result of you introducing this text? I or I guess I should say, did you see discussions happening in any new or interesting ways that you hadn't anticipated? I 
I'm going to reject the premise of your question for a second and say, of course, we saw completely different discussions among our students um, because we went from not talking about African peoples to talking about uh, African peoples. But this was not an unanticipated change. This is the purpose uh, of our book. Uh, and so it was really exciting to see students uh, be talking about people who have been erased from history. Uh, and be talking about Africans and Afro-diasporic peoples beyond just looking at Othello or looking at Orinoco. Um, there's, there's more to it than these representations of Black people by white people who are invested in thinking of Black people as inferior. Um, and so the, the big change was that we were even able to have conversations about African peoples in connection to Britain in ways that validate and affirm both that there were experiences as peoples and that those contributions are valuable. Uh, I'll throw a question out there. So now that you've created this resource, um, what, what do you see next? Uh, do you think that there's anything that this resource needs uh, that could happen in the future? <laughs> Go ahead, John. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, what we have kicked around, and th this is a much bigger project, and I, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure either of us is quite brave enough to take this on yet. What, as, as Jenny said earlier, one of the earlier slides, we never intended this to replace the existing anthology. We saw it as a supplemental textbook to go along with them. And, and it works well in that regard. The next step is, is to replace the existing anthology. It, it's to rewrite the whole thing. And, it, and this would it'd be a big project because we have to include all of those primary texts, largely which we, we don't include in this and we let the, the anthology be standard for. Be, because while this is a supplemental text and it works, it, what, what I don't like about it is it still has a bit of that feeling of like, well, here's the add on to the, the real book. And, you know, that, that undercuts our project. That's a problem. So I, ideally, the next step, and this may be for, for other people to do, I, I don't know, is, is to replace existing anthologies with this material fleshed all the way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that would just be a Herculean labor, even at the level of just managing texts that are already out there in OERs. Um, the remixing of the existing OERs would, would be just tremendous clerical labor uh, on, on top of the intellectual work of actually inserting and integrating uh, what we've developed so far. That does sound like a big project. Well, and we're here kind of being um, reserved about it. I mean, we'd also be lying to say if, if we haven't for at least five years kind of talked about, hey, we should do that big project, though. It went way before uh, the OER, the Affordable Learning Georgia even came about. So, like, we're resistant, but we can't stop talking about doing it, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, that makes sense for sure. How have the have, have the students reacted to the text beyond just being sort of amazed that their instructor's name is on it? Have they um, did they uh, give you any feedback on it? Uh, they uh, I, I have learned that one of our explanatory chapters is a bit difficult to get through, uh, and uh, <laughs> we we maybe didn't quite pitch that one right at them effectively. Uh, but there was a lot of enthusiasm about the interviews in particular. Um, and one of my students from last semester actually was in my office earlier this week saying, and I just ordered Biofictions, which is the book by Josie Gill that, that was most recently out and prize winning uh, in 2020. And so in response to seeing what she had said in the interview and, and the conversations that we all had had in class in connection with these interviews, uh, this student who isn't even an English major decided that she wanted to go out and, and get more of this and hear more from one of our interviewees, which was really just a delight. Yeah, you couldn't really hope for a, a much better reaction than that. Nah. 
Well, I think I think that student comment on the difficulty was Chris, wasn't it? Oh yes. Yeah. So uh, Chris is one of those favorites all the way around the English department. He uh, he's known for commenting on uh, the difficulty of readings. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how much I I worry too much about that. I love that guy, but yeah, I don't know. I I, I think that there are a couple of paragraphs that yeah maybe we could revisit. Yeah, all right. All right. Maybe that's the small next project. We'll, we'll, we'll revisit those paragraphs. I see that um, uh, some of our attendees, they, they saw the presentation and they went, OK, cool. And then they went to, I, I would think, their, their next thing. Um, but we do have one attendee left. Uh, James, do you have any questions? Just wanted to make sure James is one of our champions here too. Okay, uh, well, I'm going to adjourn us then uh, and thank uh, both Dr. Halpin and Dr. Elmore for uh, their work on this project, uh, for just their creativity throughout the whole thing, and for this really helpful presentation. Um, and uh, be sure to check out uh, the rest of the featured speaker series. It'll, it's on our website and uh, it will be alongside the OER that uh, the presentation corresponds to. So you will see this one um, alongside our entry uh, that's linked in OpenALG. Uh, Lucy also says, thank you so much. It's so interesting. All right, uh, I'm going to stop recording now.